right, good morning again, Life Point Crossing Church. My name is Ross. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, if you're here in person with us in the room, that's wonderful. I get to see at least the silhouette of you in here. If you're joining us online, very, very grateful that you've made it a priority to be a part of what's going on here. And uh, boy, I, this was a great week for Jim and the band to sing the My Surrender song and I don't know, make room for whatever you want to because there's going to be a little bit of a challenge today. So uh, we'll see how this goes. And I know you're thinking, like, how could there be a challenge? We're talking about love. We are talking about love. But this is going to be good. Um, how many of you did something outrageously loving this last week? I hope you did. I know everyone online is raising their hand for sure. I appreciate that. I see you guys not physically with my eyes, but I, I know you did. Um, I hope you did, because if you didn't, you might not be ready for this week. Because that was, last week we talked about doing something outrageously loving for someone in the family of faith, someone who we probably like. That was kind of elementary level. Today, we're going to college at least. This might be grad school, because who here likes a good challenge? It's kind of a trap question. I, I know I'll acknowledge that, and I said good challenge, so that makes and so it makes you more likely to, to be interested and, and raise your hand. Um, you know, there are some things, in, in putting this message together, I, was, you know, I think there are some things we actually like to be easy, and there are some things that I feel like we enjoy a challenge. And for instance, opening a jar of salsa, I want that to be easy. I don't want to feel like I have to like contortionist and like grimace and like, I just want the salsa. I, like, I, want, I want opening a jar of salsa to be very, I don't want any challenge there at all. Acquiring the necessary documents to prove to the state of Missouri that we did not previously live in the state of Missouri so that we can acquire the necessary document to go have our car registered at the DMV. I do not want that to be difficult. You guys, we are so far at a five government building procedure here. I'm hoping that six is going to be the magic number to get that done. I don't want that to be challenging. Also, I got to fix my attitude. <laughs> but I was thinking about this, and I think it's interesting. This is at least a tentative conclusion. This isn't biblical, so you can disagree. It's fine. But I think the things that we have to do, we don't have any choice. We just need to do these things. We want those to be easy. We want those to be hassle-free, no challenge whatsoever. But I think this is very interesting. When I was thinking about this, it seems to me like then when those things are done and now we can do whatever we want to do, we kind of choose things that are a little bit challenging then. Isn't that true a lot of the time? And I know maybe if you just come home from work, you're exhausted, you want to just sit and watch reruns. Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't take much. But even like, if you play video games, are the games that are the most fun that are a little bit hard, aren't they? You, you, a lot of them, don't they have, I haven't played video games in a long time now, but I've played my share that most of them have even difficulty settings so you can find the appropriate level of challenge because if it's too easy, then it's just really not very fun. Most of you know I lived in New Hampshire, and I loved hiking there. Like, all else equal, I chose the bigger, harder mountains. They were more fun. I, or, or even at, at, you know, the, the steeper, more difficult trails. And then you go home, and you kind of feel like you've done something. Hey, Ross, you want to go climb a ravine headwall? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great to me. I, whatever it is you do, if you play an instrument, I'm guessing you probably like to progress toward more challenging and difficult pieces of music, right? If, if you, whatever you do, if you make things out of wood, if you bake souffle, if you work on cars or build computers or knit or whatever it is, don't the things that gave you the most satisfaction, aren't they the things that were a little bit challenging, a little bit difficult? There was a book a few years ago that came out. It was called Do Hard Things. It was written to teenagers who they, it was, and by teenagers who felt like a lot of their peers had life a little bit too easy. And they said, just go do something hard. It's, you guys, it's so much better. You learn more. It's amazing when you accomplish something. Just go do something hard. Well, guess what? Jesus wants you to do a hard thing. And I know that's confusing because the series is about love. And how could love ever be hard? This thing's awesome and easy. You just want to do loving things for people you love, don't you? It's, it's, if you are dating or, or maybe even newly married, you're still in that stars in your eyes phase, or if you remember when you were, you just loved to do loving things for your love, didn't you? Maybe you would even sit around and just try and dream up amazing things to do for this person because you loved them so much and you just wanted to. 
And then one day they did something for you and you looked up and you said, oh, did you just do this for me because you love me because you just wanted to? And they said, honestly, I wanted to watch more office reruns, but I knew this was the loving thing. And so this is what I chose to do because this was, was going to be the way I could express my love, even though I, I really didn't want to. And you were so hurt. You, you wouldn't want anything. What is this just sick, twisted, duty something? That, that, that can't be love, can it? And I hope for you and your loved ones that you do, you just love to do loving things. But what about the people you don't love? What about the people who you don't really even like? I think I know what you do with those people. You say things like, man, I... That guy, I just try and avoid him as much as possible. I just try to not even be around him. Or that, that, that person, forget him. I don't have any time for them. I don't have any energy for them. I don't want to be around them. Man, I just nothing to do with them. And I, I, how about Chiefs fans? What if I say the name John Elway? If you had five minutes alone with that guy, what would you want to say to him? I'm not a Chiefs fan, but I do have the internet, and so I have some understanding of what an average Chiefs fan might want to say to, to John Elway, but they are not our moral authority or the Son of God. That's Jesus. And it turns out he says something very different and, and a little bit unique and kind of challenging. This is from Matthew 5, starting at verse 43. He says, you've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Yeah, that's what most of us do. Of course it is. But I say, love your Love your enemies. That's different. Pray for those who persecute you. Why would you, why would you do that? Well, in that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. I don't understand. What do you mean? Well, he gives his sunlight both to the evil and the good. Okay, that's true. And he sends rain, which they would have seen very much as a blessing. That was so they didn't starve. So he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Yeah, I, I suppose that's true. And you know what? If you love only those who love you, what's the reward for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. We talked a couple weeks about tax collectors and how abominably awful they were and how looked down on they were and... That, 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 is, that is true, and he says, he says, if you're only kind to your friends, <laughs> how are you different from anyone else? Everyone is kind to their friends. Even pagans do that. Pagan gods weren't gods of love. They didn't care how you treated anybody. They, they didn't even love you. But, but even people who, who followed those gods, like they were good to their friends. So you're supposed to be different. You're to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Do you know who it's really easy for me to love? People who are awesome to me. It's not hard for me to love my wife. She says nice things. She tells me she loves me. She builds me up. She goes shopping and brings me home shirts so I don't have to go shopping. That's a great boost for me. Sometimes if I'm working my office, she will come in with a glass of milk and a plate of cookies. You know who else would love Laura? Hitler. Stalin. Pol Pot, the Cobra Kai in the Karate Kid movie, the angriest cabbie in New York City. If she brought any one of those people a smile and a plate of cookies, they would say, I love that girl. She's the best. Of course, it's not hard for me to love my wife. If, if I was to stand before God and he said, Ross, were, were you a good person? Did you live a good life? And listen, that is not at all. This is purely hypothetical. Just to be very, very clear, we, we will never be a good enough person to be made right with God. That's what happens through Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. That's why we follow Jesus. But just hypothetically, if you, Ross, were you a good person? I said, well, you know, I, my wife was awesome to me, and I was cool with it. Like, no one's impressed by that. Like, I guess it's better than if she was awesome to me and I was a jerk about it. Like, I guess it's better than that. But I mean, really, like, who, who, doesn't, who doesn't do that? So, so Jesus says, you know what? If you're going to follow him, then we're going to try something that's a little bit leveled up from what everyone else would do. And he even goes out of his way to point out 
how the, the worst, most looked down upon people in their world were good to the people who were good to them. In our world, we have actually a diagnosis for people who are not good to the people who are good to them. It's called antisocial personality disorder. So if you're good to people who are good to you, then congratulations, you do not have that specific disorder. But that's about as low of a bar as we could possibly imagine, isn't it? That's a, a pretty low standard. So Jesus says, let's, let's try something that's a little more difficult. In fact, let's try something that's a lot more difficult. So, who do you not like? In fact, if you can think of someone who would even fit in the category of enemy for you. I don't know, you have someone? And, and if you do... Or maybe, even, maybe it's not even a specific person. Maybe it's even a group of people. That kind of makes it easier, right? You can hate a group of people. And, and that's, is, is that a little bit like less, like anti-Jesus? You feel a little less guilty about that, you know, because there's no specific name or face. It's just, you know, this, this group. But, but, and if you think of whoever it is, who, if, if they're an enemy or at least at minimum, there's someone you don't like. Immediately, it's, it's not just that though, right? Because you're thinking of why you don't like them and why they're your enemy. It's because they're terrible. Like they did something, they said something, they stand for or promote something that's really, really bad or wrong or evil. Like maybe there's a person at work who lied to your supervisor about you so that they got the promotion that you really deserved. That's terrible. Like, did you have a friend who angled in on your boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse? And maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, it doesn't even matter. Like, that is serious betrayal. Like, you would really, really dislike that person. Or maybe it is a group or, or like a class of people. You know, there are some rich people who hate poor people. There are some poor people who hate rich people. There are some middle class and poor people. Or, or maybe you're a little more sophisticated. That's a little bit crass, isn't it, to, to dislike people based on their income level. So maybe, maybe you're a little more sophisticated, but Kansas people. And maybe there's a thing, I wasn't sure if you would laugh or not there, I'm not, I don't even know how this works with Kansas, Missouri here exactly, but I do know how it worked with New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and I'm telling you, like, we had some differences, <laughs> and Massachusetts people were terrible, to just say it, you know, quite frankly, like, just don't go, either you're not going to like them, they're not going to like you, you'll at least agree. So I don't know how that correlates here or, or not with Kansas, but even if that doesn't, just keep going, what about Broncos fans? Do people have, mmm, we got a verbal response on that. Do people, is there just no oxygen in the air at 5,000 feet? So, because they just don't understand, they can't reason, they don't argue well. Could there be a more obnoxious fan base? I don't know. But, but one of the great things about what Jesus says is he doesn't say that you have to enjoy the company of your enemies. He doesn't say you have to have necessarily warm, affectionate feelings for the people who you don't like, right? You may not be able to manufacture emotions, but he does say to love and pray for people who in the same situation anybody else really would hate. Yeah, I think that's a real key here, is people who in the same situation anybody else really would hate. If you stated your case before a judge, he'd say, all right, yeah, I might feel the same way. If you bring your complaints before the pastor, he might say, well, you know what? I, I can't exactly blame you. If I were in that situation, I might feel the exact same way you do. For sure, all your friends are 100% on your side. They think this person is awful and terrible, and, and the way you feel would be 100% justifiable. If to justify it. But that's also part of the problem because Jesus says if you're good to those who are good and you're, to you and, who are, and you're bad to the people who are bad to you, who does that make you like? The answer is not Jesus. The answer is your enemies. The people who you think are terrible and you look down on, guess what? They're good to their friends and they're bad to, the, your enemy, to their enemies. They're, they're the exact same <laughs> as you if that's the way you operate. And so, 
Uh, Jesus says, let's just do something completely different. Let's love our enemies. Let's pray for the people who hurt us. Like, can that even be right? Like, who, who does that? Nobody does that. But that's exactly why it's a challenge. Jesus says, you want a challenge? But try this. Hey, love the people who are bad to you. Man, if you want to do something that's worth doing, love your enemies. If you want to make, listen, if you want to make the world a better place, love your enemies. So it's very well known, and you probably know it. But it's not very well practiced, and you probably don't practice it. Just because, I, I don't know, just as random population, I'm not saying you specifically, but there's a, a conversation that's recorded in what we call the Gospel of Luke between a, a man and Jesus. And it's actually a little bit similar to the conversation that we've been looking at the last couple weeks from, uh, that's recorded in Mark, where someone comes to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, what's the most important commandment in the law? This guy starts with the same question. He comes to Jesus, he says the same question. What's the most important commandment in the law? Except this time, Jesus doesn't answer. He kind of throws it back. He says, yeah, great question. Um, what, do you, what do you think? It's very, very interesting. The man actually pulls out the exact same two commands that Jesus does in Mark. He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus says, yeah, sounds good. I can go with that. Good answer. Right on, man. But this guy, instead of saying, all right, good enough, we agree that was a nice conversation, he just can't leave well enough alone, so he asks a follow-up. He says, okay, okay, so, but love your neighbor. Now, what do we exactly mean by neighbor? Who, who counts? Like, who doesn't count? Um, like, how are we in our terms here? And this is where it says, Jesus replied with a story. It says, well, a Jewish man, and these people were all Jews. Jesus was a Jew. He's talking to Jews. We're all Jews here today um, in, in this situation. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. That really, truly was a very, very dangerous road. There were lots of places where people got, that happened commonly. And they stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Well, by chance, a priest came along. Of course, a priest was also that's a Jewish priest, and so they, they shared their Jewish, Jewish ethnicity and religion. This was incredibly important to them, far more than our you know, national identity or whatever that may be. And of course, he's a priest of the very God who has these commandments to love him and to love your neighbor. So he would seem to be a prime candidate to help this individual, but of course, when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. So a temple assistant, a little bit lower of a position, but all of the same reasons that he could do something and take action that the priest had, well, he, he walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. And then a despised Samaritan, and I, I didn't look at the Greek, and I barely can even recognize Greek at this point, but I suspect that they in inserted the word despised there so we would understand uh, how this works, because probably if you don't know, you've, you've at least heard of Samaritan, and probably when you hear or think of Samaritan, if you don't know, probably you might just think, oh, I guess those are people, because this, this you get it from exactly the story that Jesus told 200, two, excuse me, 2,000 years ago. Jesus didn't tell this around the time of Paul Revere. It was 2,000 years ago. Um, and you might, Samaritan, I don't know, are those people who, like, they would just go around looking for people who needed a hand and, and help them out? Is that, I don't know, that's kind of how we think of Samaritans, right? Is the Samaritan is someone who helps people? That was not how they thought of Samaritans. Samaritans were people who lived in a place called Samaria. I know that's confusing too, but that's just what the place was called. It's just what the place was called. And, and they were sort of like the hated state stepbrother, stepsister, the, the Jews and the Samaritans absolutely despised each other. They would not even speak to each other. So they absolutely would have described themselves as dead up 100% enemies. So it's the despised Samaritan who came along and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. And he didn't just feel compassion, he showed compassion. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. 
And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. And the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, Jesus says, which of these three, the priest, the temple assistant, the despised Samaritan, which of these would you say, since we're going back and forth here, which of these would you say, define this for yourself, sir, who is my neighbor? Which one was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. And of course, he's given him very clearly exactly one reasonable option. And so the man replied, well, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, yes. Of course, I made that very easy for you. It's interesting, a lot of the time people get Jesus' answers wrong, but this guy, Jesus, okay, this is kind of second grade level, so yes, you got it. Um, but now that you got it, go do the same. It turns out when Jesus says to love your neighbor, that doesn't just mean the people who you have warm feelings toward. It means love your enemies. And then he says, go do it. So guess what we're going to do today? Guess what? Listen, I, I know it's hard to just go cold to do something for your enemy. So what we are going to do is I'm, I'm going to suggest that we do this in just the opposite order of the way Jesus presents it. He says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Let's start with prayer. So do you, you remember the person who is your enemy that you thought of a couple minutes ago, right? Or the, If you have no enemies, you're just that guy, the person who you at least don't like. Can you do this? Can you commit to pray for him? You can do that. Listen, you can do that. And it really is incredible. The more you start to pray for someone, the more actually your heart starts to change toward them. So that's really kind of a wonderful first step. Um, but then, let's not just stop and pray for them. Let's go do something. Yeah, I'm 100% serious about this. Let's, let's take the same phrase that we had last week, but let's, this week, Let's every one of us do something outrageously loving for your enemy. Or at least the person you don't like. Okay? And this is, this is last week again, that was elementary level. That was easy because this is, that was doing something for loving, loving for someone who you probably did like or at least could tolerate. So this week, I, I know how you guys work. Right? And again, even those of you who I don't know, I, don't use specific, I just know how people work is what I'm saying, all right? Not saying you guys are any worse than any other room full of people. I'm glad you're here. But, but you're going to need some rules this week because I, I just know how this works. So rule number one, make it outrageous. Really make it, listen, giving someone an Altoid is a nice gesture. <laughs> If you need to, go back. It was Luke 10. Go back and reread the parable that Jesus told. That wasn't giving someone a breath mint. That was doing something outrageously loving. So make it as big as you can. All right? Number two. Don't be smug. Like, don't be a jerk. Just be awesome to somebody. All right? You're not trying to make them feel badly about how they've treated you. That's, that's not loving, and really that's about you. You're, not try, you're, you're just following Jesus. This isn't really about you. This isn't even about your enemy. This isn't about your enemy. This is about you just being the, the Jesus follower that he calls you to be. So and maybe they get confused and they ask you, like, why are you doing this? Here's what you are not allowed to say is because, well, Jesus and or my pastor said I should do something loving for someone who's terrible. Yeah, you, you understand why I have to say this, don't you? Listen, here, I do think it's okay to say, well, Jesus and or my pastor said that we, we should be great to everybody, so I know we haven't gotten along, but I, I just wanted to do this for you. Okay, that, I think that's okay. But don't be a jerk. Don't be smug. You're not trying to manipulate anybody or make them feel badly about how they've treated you. None of that is what Jesus is talking about, right? Very clearly. Again, if you need to go back, read the parable, Luke 10, it'll be very clear. Um, and then I'm very, very serious about, about pray. Listen, this, isn't, this still isn't about you. This is about you submitting to God. Get your heart right before your God and follow him 
into this. This isn't about you. This isn't about your enemy. This is about you following Jesus and doing what he calls you to. I know it's hard. Like, I know this is weird. Like, this is a really, really weird thing. Your political party is not preaching this, whichever side of any fence you land on. But this is, but listen, I know this is going to be awkward. I know it's going to require something from you. But I, I hope you don't want to be a part of the church where you're supposed to just come and sit and then not have anything that impacts your life. So let's really do this. Let's be the followers of Jesus who do some stuff. And what do you think is going to happen, you guys? Just think this through a little bit. What do you think is going to happen if we really do this? Number one, I think you're going to have fewer enemies. Well, that's kind of positive, isn't it? And you know what? Some of your enemies, some of the people you don't like, they might really be those terrible people who take advantage of your kindness and st still treat you terribly. That might be. That's okay. You're, still, you're, you're not doing it to change them. You're just doing this to follow Jesus. But I do suspect that if you're cool to more people, you're going to have less people who you would describe as your enemies and who would describe you as your enemies. So that's actually kind of a wonderful thing, isn't it? Okay. Along with that, uh, you're going to have a lot less hatred to carry around. That's nice. Like, honestly, if you're here today and you are not a follower of Jesus, you're just interested or, or curious or checking things out, you have absolutely no obligation to do this. But you still might want to. You might still do this and discover that it's a lot better for you and for your health and happiness and joy to engage in, in some forgiveness and some love rather than carrying around a hatred or, or a grudge or trying to get even. You, again, this, this is actually not only good for your enemy, this is actually good for you. And then think for a moment about what might happen. Like, like what if churches and people who follow Jesus everywhere actually really acted a little more like Jesus calls us to? Like how different would our churches be? How different would our world be? And don't you think there would be a lot more people interested in considering the claims of Jesus if his followers acted more like he did, if we had fewer people, like there's a famous quote from Gandhi who said, well, you know, I, I like your Christ. Ah, I just don't like your Christians. And, and you guys, like I'm not here to make you feel mad. I'm not mad at you or to make you feel guilty about that because maybe part of what Gandhi didn't understand is that the very entry point of following Jesus is that like, man, I have some messed up stuff and I'm not good enough. And so like, we're always going to not be perfect. We're always going to have something that someone can look to and point to and say, oh yeah, well that's hypocritical or they're, they're not perfect followers of Jesus. And the moment we think we are perfect followers of Jesus, then we need to get some more people in here who that we can help point forward to, to getting to where, you know, you think you've arrived at. So I'm, I'm, like, I'm not mad at you because you're not perfect. That's why we have Jesus, is to do for us what we can't do for ourselves, because we're never going to be good enough. Savior is never going to make us right with God. So please understand that. But what if, what if we actually, if, if we did this, not even just once, but as sort of a pattern and a habit of being loving toward people, even when they treated us terribly, even when we didn't like them, even when they would describe us as their enemies. Oh, don't you think that would make an amazing world? Wouldn't you want to be a part of that? Well, you can't do all of that. Even all of us together, we can't do all of that. But man, we can do what we can do. And you can do what you can do. Not on your own, but so Right? Don't, I, it's number three there, but it's kind of step number one. To follow Jesus into loving your enemies and being kind even to the people who aren't kind to you. I know it's not normal. I know it's not natural. That's why Jesus had to say it. That's why Luke thought that this is probably worth writing down and remembering. Don't you think? I know it's not easy. I know you don't want to. It's hard. This is a challenge but it is clearly and repeatedly exactly what our Lord calls us to. So you have a week, you're on the clock. And listen, I'm tremendously interested to hear what you're going to tell me you did and for whom next week. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much that when we were your enemies, lost in our own sinfulness and selfishness. That you 
showed us the most inexpressible love that the universe has ever seen. So that we could be reconciled to you and live lives that have meaning and purpose and love and be a part of something bigger than ourselves and live the lives that you have for us as your followers and in relationship with the God who created the universe. What, it's, the, the more times I say it, the, the more amazing it means and the, the more mundane it means and I don't even know how to work the two of those together. Grateful that you practiced what you preached and we're grateful to have the opportunity to imitate you and step into that as well. You're still praying here today. Maybe you're here and, and you came in and you really weren't sure about following Jesus. Or maybe you, you were and you're, you know this happens at the end of every service here and you've just been waiting for this opportunity. You know that this is your moment to make that decision, to come to him and to follow him with your whole life. Listen, we're so grateful. You're the reason why Life Point Crossing here is, is here today. If you would, you can just pray to God and if you'd say it out loud or even just in your heart to him and he'll hear you. Say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again so that I could be forgiven and be adopted as a child in your family. I know my life and my behavior can never be enough, but I'm grateful that Jesus has done for me what I could not do for myself. Please forgive me, adopt me, and make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. If you just did that for the first time, we could not be any more excited for what God's doing in your life. If you would, please do, us, do yourself a favor and go to Ternessa at the point outside in the lobby. That's just the corner in the lobby, and she'll be there so we can connect you with some next steps and have you walking down a healthy path toward following Jesus. The, it, the absolute greatest decision you can make in, in your entire life. Hey, for the rest of us, you know who your person is. I'm sure you do. And maybe right now you know what your step is to do, and maybe you, you don't know that yet. But just right now, between yourself and the Spirit of God, cement this decision. Do your business with him. Commit that you are going not just to understand what Jesus says. This is a very simple message to understand. You didn't need me to explain it to you, but you're, you're going to step into action and become the person who God has for you, praying for and then following up and doing something way out of the box, way outrageously loving, not even in your own name, but in the name of Jesus Christ whom you serve for the person who you don't even like. What a beautiful, wonderful opportunity to be a part of. Father, we, we thank you for that opportunity. We ask you in your spirit for the supernatural strength and courage and follow through, especially for this tremendously challenging message to make this Sunday morning commitment into Monday through Saturday life change and stepping into being the person and the follower of you that you created us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, who we worship and we give our lives to serve. Amen.